"'My father made the fellow gardener,' said my companion, "'and then, as that did not satisfy him, he was promoted to be butler. "'The house seemed to be at his mercy, and he wandered about and did what he chose in it. "'The maids complained of his drunken habits and his vile language. "'The dad raised their wages all round to recompense them for their annoyance. "'The fellow would take the boat and my father's best guns and treat himself to little shooting trips.' and all this with such a sneering, leering, insolent face that I would have knocked him down twenty times over if he had been a man of my own age. I tell you, Holmes, I've had to keep a tight hold upon myself all this time, and now I'm asking myself whether, if I had let myself go a little more, I might not have been a wiser man. Well, matters went from bad to worse with us, and this animal Hudson became more and more intrusive, until at last, on making some insolent reply to my father in my presence one day, I took him by the shoulders and turned him out of the room. He slunk away with a livid face and two venomous eyes, which uttered more threats than his tongue could do. I don't know what passed between the poor dad and him after that, but the dad came to me next day and asked me whether I would mind apologizing to Hudson. I refused, as you can imagine, and asked my father how he could allow such a wretch to take such liberties with himself and his household. "'Ah, my boy,' said he, "'it is all very well to talk, but you don't know how I am placed.' "'But you shall know, Victor. "'I'll see that you shall know, come what may. "'You wouldn't believe harm of your poor old father, would you, lad?' "'He was very much moved and shut himself up in the study all day, "'where I could see through the window that he was writing busily. "'That evening there came what seemed to me to be a grand release, "'for Hudson told us that he was going to leave us. "'He walked into the dining-room as we sat after dinner "'and announced his intention in the thick voice of a half-drunken man.' "'I've had enough of Norfolk,' said he. "'I'll run down to Mr. Beddoes in Hampshire. "'He'll be as glad to see me as you were, I dare say.' "'You're not going away in an unkind spirit, Hudson, I hope,' "'said my father with a tameness which made my blood boil. "'I've not had my apology,' said he sulkily, glancing in my direction. "'Victor, you will acknowledge that you have used this worthy fellow rather roughly,' "'said the dad, turning to me.' "'On the contrary, I think that we have both shown extraordinary patience towards him,' I answered. "'Oh, you do, do you?' he snarls. "'Very good, mate. We'll see about that.' He slouched out of the room, and half an hour afterwards left the house, leaving my father in a state of pitiable nervousness. Night after night I heard him pacing his room, and it was just as he was recovering his confidence that the blow did at last fall. "'And how?' I asked eagerly. "'In a most extraordinary fashion.' A letter arrived from my father yesterday evening, bearing the Fording Bridge postmark. My father read it, clapped both his hands to his head, and began running around the room in little circles, like a man who has been driven out of his senses. When I at last drew him down onto the sofa, his mouth and eyelids were all puckered on one side, and I saw that he had a stroke. Dr. Fordham came over at once. We put him to bed, but the paralysis has spread. He has shown no sign of returning consciousness and I think that we shall hardly find him alive. "'You horrify me, Trevor,' I cried. "'What then could have been in this letter to cause so dreadful a result?' "'Nothing. There lies the inexplicable part of it. The message was absurd and trivial. Oh, my God! It is as I feared!' As he spoke, we came round the curve of the avenue, and saw in the fading light that every blind in the house had been drawn down. As we dashed up to the door, my friend's face convulsed with grief, a gentleman in black emerged from it. "'When did it happen, doctor?' asked Trevor. "'Almost immediately after you left.' "'Did he recover consciousness?' "'For an instant before the end.' "'Any message for me?' "'Only that the papers were in the back drawer of the Japanese cabinet.' My friend ascended with the doctor to the chamber of death, while I remained in the study, turning the whole matter over and over in my head and feeling as sombre as ever I had done in my life. What was the past of this Trevor, pugilist, traveller, and gold-digger, and how had he placed himself in the power of this acid-faced seaman? Why, too, should he faint at an allusion to the half-effaced initials upon his arm, and die of fright when he had a letter from Fordingham? Then I remembered that Fordingham was in Hampshire, and that this Mr. Beddoes, whom the seaman had gone to visit, and presumably to blackmail, had also been mentioned as living in Hampshire. The letter, then, might either come from Hudson, the seaman saying that he had betrayed the guilty secret which appeared to exist, or it might come from Beddoes, warning an old confederate that such a betrayal was imminent. So far it seemed clear enough, 
But then how could this letter be trivial and grotesque, as described by the son? He must have misread it. If so, it must have been one of those ingenious secret codes, which mean one thing while they seem to mean another. I must see this letter. If there were a hidden meaning in it, I was confident that I could pluck it forth. For an hour I sat pondering it over in the gloom, until at last a weeping maid brought in a lamp, and close at her heels came my friend Trevor, pale but composed, with these very papers which lie upon my knee, held in his grasp. He sat down opposite to me, drew the lamp to the edge of the table, and handed me a short note scribbled, as you see, upon a single sheet of grey paper. The supply of game for London is going steadily up, it ran. Headkeeper Hudson, we believe, has been now told to receive all orders for fly-paper and for preservation of your hen-pheasant's life. I dare say my face looked as bewildered as yours did just now when first I read this message. Then I re-read it very carefully. It was evidently as I had thought, and some secret meaning must lie buried in this strange combination of words. Or could it be that there was a prearranged significance to such phrases as fly-paper and hen-pheasant? Such a meaning would be arbitrary, and could not be deduced in any way. And yet I was loath to believe that this was the case, and the presence of the word Hudson seemed to show that the subject of the message was as I had guessed, and that it was from Beddoes rather than the sailor. I tried it backwards, but the combination life pheasant's hen was not encouraging. Then I tried alternate words, but neither the of four nor supply game London promised to throw any light upon it. And then, in an instant, the key of the riddle was in my hands, and I saw that every third word, beginning with the first, would give a message which might well drive old Trevor to despair. It was short and terse, the warning, as I now read it to my companion. The game is up. Hudson has told all. Fly for your life. Victor Trevor sank his face into his shaking hands. It must be that, I suppose, said he. This is worse than death, for it means disgrace as well. But what is the meaning of these head-keepers and hen-pheasants? It means nothing to the message, but it might mean a good deal to us if we had no other means of discovering the sender. You see that he has begun by writing, the game is, and so on. Afterwards he had to fulfill the prearranged cipher to fill in any two words in each space. He would naturally use the first words which came to his mind and if there were so many which preferred to sport among them, you may be tolerably sure that he is either an ardent shot or interested in breeding. Do you know anything of this Beddoes? Why, now that you mention it, said he, I remember that my poor father used to have an invitation from him to shoot over his preserves every autumn. Then it is undoubtedly from him that the note comes, said I. It only remains for us to find out what this secret was which the sailor Hudson seems to have held over the heads of these two wealthy and respected men. Alas, Holmes, I fear that it is one of sin and shame, cried my friend, but from you I shall have no secrets. Here is the statement which was drawn up by my father when he knew that the danger from Hudson had become imminent. I found it in the Japanese cabinet, as he told the doctor. Take it and read it to me, for I have neither the strength nor the courage to do it myself." These are the very papers, Watson, which he handed to me, and I will read them to you, as I read them in the old study that night to him. They are endorsed outside, as you see, some particulars of the voyage of the bark Gloria Scott, from her leaving Falmouth on the 8th October, 1855, to her destruction in north latitude 15 degrees 20 minutes, west longitude 25 degrees 14 minutes, on November 6th. It is in the form of a letter, and runs in this way. My dear, dear son, now that approaching disgrace begins to darken the closing years of my life, I can write with all truth and honesty that it is not the terror of the law, it is not the loss of my position in the county, nor is it my fall in the eyes of all who have known me which cuts me to the heart, but it is the thought that you should come to blush for me, you who love me and who have seldom, I hope, had reason to do other than respect me. But if the blow falls which is forever hanging over me, then I should wish you to read this, that you may know straight from me how far I have been to blame. On the other hand, if all should go well, which may kind God Almighty grant, then if by any chance this paper should be still undestroyed and should fall into your hands, I conjure you, by all you hold sacred, by the memory of your dear mother, and by the love which had been between us, to hurl it into the fire, and to never give one thought to it again. If then your eye goes on to read this line, I know that I shall already have been exposed and dragged from my home, 
or, as is more likely, for you know that my heart is weak, by lying with my tongue sealed forever in death. In either case, the time for suppression is past, and every word which I tell you is the naked truth, and this I swear as I hope for mercy. My name, dear lad, is not Trevor. I was James Armitage in my younger days, and you can understand now the shock that it was to me a few weeks ago when your college friend addressed me in words which seemed to imply that he had surprised my secret. As Armitage, it was that I entered a London banking house, and as Armitage, I was convicted of breaking my country's laws, and was sentenced to transportation. Do not think very harshly of me, laddie. It was a debt of honour, so called, which I had to pay, and I used money which was not my own to do it, in the certainty that I could replace it before there could be any possibility of its being missed. But the most dreadful ill luck pursued me. The money which I had reckoned upon never came to hand, and a premature examination of accounts exposed my deficit. The case might have been dealt leniently with, but the laws were more harshly administered thirty years ago than now, and on my twenty-third birthday I found myself chained as a felon with thirty-seven other convicts in tween decks of the bark Gloria Scott, bound for Australia. It was the year fifty-five, when the Crimean War was at its height, and the old convict ships had been largely used as transports in the Black Sea. The government was compelled, therefore, to use smaller and less suitable vessels for sending out their prisoners. The Gloria Scott had been in the Chinese tea trade, but she was an old-fashioned, heavy-bowed, broad-beamed craft, and the new clippers had cut her out. She was a five-hundred-ton boat, and besides her thirty-eight jailbirds, she carried twenty-six of a crew, eighteen soldiers, a captain, three mates, a doctor, a chaplain, and four warders. Nearly a hundred souls were in her, all told, when we set sail from Falmouth. The partitions between the cells of the convicts, instead of being of thick oak as is usual in convict ships, were quite thin and frail. The man next to me, upon the aft side, was one whom I had particularly noticed when we were led down the quay. He was a young man with a clear, hairless face, a long, thin nose, and a rather nutcracker jaws. He carried his head very jauntily in the air, had a swaggering style of walking, and was, above all else, remarkable for his extraordinary height. I don't think any of our heads would have come up to his shoulder, and I am sure that he could not have measured less than six and a half feet. It was strange among so many sad and weary faces to see one which was full of energy and resolution. The sight of it was to me like a fire in a snowstorm. I was glad then to find that he was my neighbour, and gladder still when, in the dead of the night, I heard a whisper close to my ear, and found that he had managed to cut an opening in the board which separated us. "'Hello, chummy,' said he. "'What's your name, and what are you here for?' I answered him, and asked in turn who I was talking with. "'I'm Jack Prendergast,' said he, "'and by God, you'll learn to bless my name before you've done with me.' I remembered hearing of this case, for it was one which had made an immense sensation throughout the country some time before my own arrest. He was a man of good family and of great ability, but of incurably vicious habits, who had by an ingenious system of fraud obtained huge sums of money from the leading London merchants. "'Ha! ha! You remember my case,' said he proudly. "'Very well, indeed. Then maybe you remember something queer about it.' "'What was that, then?' I'd had nearly a quarter of a million, hadn't I? So it was said. But none was recovered, eh? No. Well, where do you suppose the balance is? he asked. I have no idea, said I. Right between my finger and thumb, he cried. By God, I've got more pounds to my name than you've hairs on your head. And if you've money, my son, and know how to handle it and spread it, you can do anything. Now, you don't think it likely that a man who could do anything is going to wear his breeches out sitting in the stinking hold of a rat-gutted, beetle-ridden, mouldy old coffin of a chinchina coaster? No, sir, such a man will look after himself, and will look after his chums. You may lay to that, you hold on to him, and you may kiss the book that he'll haul you through. That was his style of talk, and at first I thought it meant nothing, but after a while, when he had tested me and sworn me in with all possible solemnity, he let me understand that there really was a plot to gain command of the vessel— a dozen of the prisoners had hatched it before they came aboard. Prendergast was the leader, and his money was the motive power. 